Hello. This is a video demonstrating the, the process of uh, assembling a surface mount circuit board. So this is similar to um, what we do on, on my workshop at various events. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this board and we're going to apply solder paste to it. And then we're going to use tweezers to put components on. And then we're going to bake it on a hot plate. And then we're going to test it to make sure it works. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to apply paste with this stencil. Now this stencil is a laser cut piece of steel and it has holes where the pads of the components are going to go. And we're going to mount it to the circuit board with these screws. Now the screws are very, very slightly conical, right where the tread meets the head. So we're going to put the screw on the bottom side of the board so that it doesn't bend the stencil as it gets tightened. So there's two alignment holes in here that fix the stencil to the board. Now you need to make sure before you tighten the nuts that the stencil is aligned so you can only see gold through, through the holes in the stencil and no circuit board cover at all. That knot's got some solder paste in it, so it's kind of hard to tighten. I just picked up a fresh one. All right, before you tighten the second nut, you want to make sure that the stencil is aligned. Okay, so. Now I'm going to apply the solder paste. This is solder paste. It's a mixture of solder and flux. There's tiny little balls of solder and they're floating in flux. So here's some solder paste. This is more than we need, but it's all right. So I'm going to use this to spread it. And now if you've done uh, silk screen printing before, you know exactly what you're doing. If not, you're trying to get the angle so that it, the solder paste spreads over a large surface. So you want to cover as much area as possible in one move. So you spread it and then you collect it. So we've now done this area, except that little pad at the end, but it's not. There we go, we've now done this area. This area is now done. And on large pads like this, you want to go diagonally because otherwise you're just going to scrape the paste out. Here we go. So we've now printed the paste. Now we're going to take the nuts off. Push the screw strong. Gently lift the stencil. I don't know how visible this is. You can see they're spaced on the pads. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take some alcohol and some paper and we're going to clean the stencil. 
Now, you want to move the board out of the way where you want to spray on it or smudge it. And you put the stencil on the paper. Spray through the holes. Wipe down. Turn it around. And do the same. There. The stencil is now clean. And we can now reuse it. Now we're also going to clean the mirror. And the base from the, the tool. Okay, so now we have our board. We don't need these anymore. And we're going to use these tweezers to place parts on. Now the tweezers, you want to hold them so that they rest on your middle finger and in the bend of the hand. If you're left-handed, just do the same on the other side. All right, so use these two fingers to close them. And you want your hand on the table at all times. And what you want to do is pick and place. Straight line movements are good. Rotation is bad. Now rotation is bad because if you rotate your hand, one side of the part lifts up and the other side of the part dips down and you can't place it precisely anymore. So what you want to do, if you need rotation, you can rotate the mirror, you can rotate the board with your off hand, but don't rotate your hand. All right. If your hands are shaking because you have too much mat or whatever, um, you can press down lightly on the table to stabilize. And if you need more stabilization, you can put a second hand on top for more stability. And you want to be working as close to the tip as possible. So you don't want to be working cross over here. Instead, you want to rotate things so, so as to make your life easy. All right, so our first component. Our first component is a 10 microfarad capacitor in size 1206. That is 12 by 6 centi inches. Yeah, I know it's a stupid unit, but it's how it is. All right, so you pick it up by the short side. If you pick it up by the long side, first you're not going to be able to place it as precisely. Second, if you squeeze too hard, it's going to fly across the room. And third, if you place it with the tweezer tips here, you're going to dip your tweezer tips in the paste every time. And you'll get paste on them and parts will stick to them and make your life difficult. And we're here to make your life easy, so... Alright, so these are 10 microfarad capacitors. The label on the board is 10U, 10U, 10U. So you place one here. You don't need to press it down, just place it. The paste is thick enough to hold it in place. Here we go. Thank you. Next part, 22 microfarad capacitors. Those live over here. Now note these look exactly exactly the same. There is no way to tell them apart except measuring. So resistors sometimes have markings. These capacitors, they don't have any markings at all. So you can't tell which is which. All right, for the next part, we're going down two sizes to 0603, that's six by three centi inches. Now we only have five of these on the board. These are 10 kilo ohm resistors. We only have five of them on the board. But there's a practice area here, so you can practice a bit before before you place them. So I'll place a few in the practice area just for fun. All right, now these are six by three centi inches. And they have a little marking on top. And you place them the exact same way. Hold them by the short end. And you pick them in place. Now 
Now I'm going to place one really badly just so you can see what happens when it's not correctly placed. I'm going to place one like that. All right, so we have five of them in the actual circuit. They're labeled with 10K, 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 10K. So we're going to place those. Now, officially, black side is on top because that's where the markings are. But they work either way, so you don't need to worry too much about which way, which way up you place them. Yeah, I'm going to place a few of these because I need some extras. So this one I've actually placed in on the wrong pads. So it's supposed to go between these two. So if you mess up, you can just lift it and place it. And also you can place them upside down. They'll work just fine. All right, enough of that. I don't need these anymore. All right, next part is the 22 nanofarad capacitor over here. That's C17. Here we go. There's only one of these. And it's the same size as the ones before, although it doesn't look like it. It's the same size as over here. All right, next part. Now we're getting to bigger parts. This is the large inductor, which lives over here. Now, this one, if you look in the mirror, I don't know if this is visible from there, but if you just lift it a bit and look in the mirror, you can see the underside. And this tells you which way around it goes. So it's got two metal strips underneath. They need to go in the same direction as the base strips. Right, then we have the small inductor. There we go. That lives over here. Then we have two potentiometers. Now these ones are a bit special. So they have two legs on one end, one leg on the other. So if you lift it up a bit, you can see in the mirror image which way around they're meant to go. So this one goes here. This one goes here. They're both the same. So it doesn't matter which one, which one you place here or place. All right. Then we have the boost converter IC. Now this one has a tiny white dot in one corner there. Probably can't see it on the video. If you look at it at an angle or shine a light at it at an angle, you can see the tiny white dot. It's laser marked on one corner. And that, that's the identifier for the first spin. Now over here we have a giant white circle. So tiny white dot goes in the same corner as giant white circle. All right, next part is the buck converter. Now this is a 16 pin QFN, which means it has pads on all four sides. And they're 0 0.5 millimeters apart. And this one also has a tiny white dot. Now, because of parallax, if you stand next to the table and look down at the pads at an angle, uh, you're going to place it in the wrong place. So to place this correctly, you need to actually be looking at it straight down. All right, and again, tiny white dot, same corner as giant white circle. And you want to place it and then look down on it. You want to see the same amount of paste on each side. And if it's not quite right, you can just nudge it very gently with the tweezers till it's in the right place. 
Okay, it is now in the right place. That's good. I'm going to start the uh, hot plate preheating already. So our target temperature for the hot plate is a few degrees below reflow temperature. So the reflow temperature for this solder paste is 217 degrees. So we're going to preheat this to around 200. And to measure this, I use this infrared thermometer. So we're going to monitor that in a bit. But before that, now, if we're doing these at a workshop, we'd have this problem that once they're baked, they all look exactly the same. And now to tell them apart, everybody gets to make a pattern of 0402s in this area. Now these are 10 kilo ohm resistors in 0402 size. There we go. And I'm just gonna place a bunch of these and make a nice pattern. So let's zoom in so you can see. Uh, they're sticking to the tips of your tweezers. Take some paper and squeeze it. Pull. And that takes the paste off the tweezer tips.
All right, there we go. So that's the part done. Now let's see what the hot plate says. It says 250, that's too hot. So because this hot plate is really uneven, I'm just going to find the spot that's cool enough. So here near the bottom, it's around 215. So I'm just going to use that spot. All right, so I'm going to slide this board over to the hot plate and then bring it up to temperature. And now uh, we can monitor the board with the thermometer. So it's heating up. Now we need the board to get to 217 degrees. And you can actually see it reflow when that happens. Now this is a really terrible hot plate. The heating element's really uneven. So you'll probably see some parts of the board reflow before others. My board is now at Seven. We should be seeing in the hotter parts of the board. There we go. Now we're seeing some reflowing. So you can see that the solder is actually melting. And slide this over here because it's a bit hotter here. You can you can see the wave of reflow just go across. Now as the parts melt they actually float on the molten solder on the molten solder and this applies a force to them so that they center themselves a bit. So sometimes your parts will actually straighten on their own. And this has happened with all these O402s over, over here. And you remember the one that we placed really badly? Uh, it's still a bit crooked, but it's starting to straighten itself out. All right, so the next thing we'll do, we'll take the board and slide it gently off the hot plate. Now everything has reflowed now. So this board is still too hot to touch. All right, we're going to leave the hot plate to cool to the side a bit. And meanwhile, we're going to test this board. All right, so I said it's too hot to touch, but it's not too hot to test. So we're going to test this now. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to do an E-test. That's electrical test, so we're looking for short circuits. So that is the sound of failure. We don't like failure. All right, so no failure, no failure, no failure. I'm testing short across input, short across output, and short from input plus to output plus. 
and same on the other side. There we go. So all of these are fine. By fine, I mean they pass electrical testing, which means if we apply power now, they probably won't blow up. Okay, so let's do some functional testing. So here we go. I'm just going to connect all the grounds together. So I have this green crocodile clip and the black that goes here to the negative pole of this 1.5 volt battery and the positive pole. Let's see, can you see that? Yeah, positive pole is at. 1.42 volts. All right, so we're starting with 1.42 volts and we're gonna test the boost converter. Now there's a ground connection in the corner so we can use that for testing. Uh, it's cooled down enough that we don't need this insulator here anymore. Okay, so I'm measuring the output voltage when the input voltage is 1.4. And on the output, we have 3.01. Now this is pretty much spot on. So if this if this uh, potentiometer is delivered in exactly the center position, which they never are, then it will get exactly three volts. All right, now this is adjustable. I can turn this potentiometer. So if I want a higher voltage, I can turn this up a little bit. Here we are, 3.2. And this is adjustable anywhere between two and five and a half. All right, so that was the boost converter. And that definitely works. Now let's try the buck converter. And to test the buck converter, we're going to use an old laptop power supply, which provides 12 volts. just lost my test lead, that's all right. We'll just use this. Okay, so the supply is 11.3 volts, should be 12, but oh well. All right, so we're measuring the output voltage, the input voltage at 11.3, and the output voltage is Okay, this should work. So the output voltage is 2.78, and that also is adjustable. Yeah. yeah. That's adjustable between 0 0.9 and 5.5. All right, that's it. That's the entire process. So we've basically done exactly the same thing that would happen in an assembly factory. So we've done face printing, we've done pick and place, we've done reflow, and we've done electrical and functional testing. So this is it. This is how you, you can prototype your own boards.